This episode of Tools for the Future is about information design. I made this with a good friend of mine, Maria Judice, so she deserves credit too for some of the content. Because many experiences today contain so much data or information, these can have a huge impact on the experiences that we create. Understanding how people understand is crucial to creating experiences that work for them. Information design is focused on how data and information, which are different things, are organized and presented within an experience. Information design shapes the understanding of an experience or a device or just a set of data. Even experiences that can be configured in different ways need to start in one state or another. This is called a mental model. And what we design builds a mental model for our audiences. Consider the example of bad information design. When information design isn't considered well, it can have monumental effects on the outcomes of experiences. To start with, understanding is a spectrum, one that starts with data at one end, which is raw, and progressive to more and more complex constructions that build upon each other. All of this is in understanding, but at different levels of detail. We don't know who first proposed this relationship. There are references to it from the 1930s, and more concrete descriptions were discussed from many sources throughout the 1950s. The important thing is that this diagram is trying to tell us that context is critical. Data isn't terribly valuable, despite what people in Silicon Valley might tell you. It's necessary, of course, but in its raw form, there's not much to understand because it lacks so much context. Unless we can give it context, and the appropriate context at the appropriate time, it really doesn't have any value for us. In order to progress to the first step, transforming data into information, we need to give care to both its organization and its presentation, which are also different. Data and information can be communicated in many different ways. All of these we have some experience with ourselves. But there are only so many ways to organize data and turn it into information. Richard Saul Werman, one of my mentors, always said that there were five ways to organize things. He called them his hat racks. He also developed the term LATCH, L-A-T-C-H, to stand for these five ways, location, alphabet, time, category, and hierarchy. But hierarchy isn't really a helpful term to me because hierarchies can be more complex than a spectrum. And that's what's really happening here. These are spectra or magnitudes, going from one end of something to another. In addition, time and alphabet are also just spectra, but specialized ones. They flow again from one end of or one point to another where location and category don't. So they share a relationship that location and category don't. For speakers of some languages, the alphabet moves from A to Z or vice versa. Note that the alphabet can be different in different languages and cultures, though. But it's fairly well known, so it becomes a common way of organizing things. Note, though, that it's only a good way to organize things as long as you understand what it's called and how that's spelled. For many children learning to, to read or speak, asking them to look it up in the dictionary isn't really much of a help if they don't know how to spell it in the first place. Time, too, is a special kind of spectrum moving from past to present to the future. It can be subdivided into smaller pieces, and though we only experience it in one direction, we can also obviously use it to organize and present things in both directions. Location is nearly always more than one dimension, and it can involve two or three or potentially even more. Categories can be of any number, as they separate things by some sort of salient difference. However, research has shown that the more categories isn't necessarily better. Humans only have the capacity to keep in mind, in short-term memory, just five to seven to nine things. So if you're requiring people to memorize things, the fewer the categories, the better. If you're not requiring people to memorize things, have at it. Have as many categories as you want, as long as they're easily searchable or browsable. While Richard says that there are five ways of organizing everything, I actually add two other ways, numbers and random. Numbers are exactly the same as alphabets, 
except you substitute numbers for letters, of course. But number systems can go on forever from zero to infinity and often go in both directions, whereas alphabets don't commonly organize things that way. They can also be divided into smaller numbers like a 114.567, etc. In fact, that's how library systems work in the Dewey Decimal and Melville systems. Numbers then denote different categories uh, and classifications. So in this case, a Dewey Decimal system, a number moves from zero to a thousand, but each each step along the way are categories and subcategories of topics within a library system. So methods of organization can be combined. The last way to organize anything is simply not to organize it purposefully. This is important when the challenge for the audience or, or the use is to organize the experience themselves or find their way through the data. For example, how fun would a game be if you entered and everything was already figured out and neatly arranged? The point of many games is the disorganization that calls us to explore and make sense of it ourselves. To be sure, that's probably not the most helpful way to organize information that others need to understand critically or immediately, but we have to understand that it's an option. Most of what we design requires us to organize data so that the mental model is clear, but there are cases where that's not the objective. This is where mental models begin, with structure. It's not until you see the same set of data arranged in different ways that you can understand the patterns and relationships between them. This is how we build knowledge. We also need different kinds of organizations to help us find things from, from different needs or perspectives. Most complex data sets most information that we uh, present to our audiences, our users, our participants, etc., actually combine these seven ways of organizing things. Partially, this is because not everyone has the same needs or the same context or the same objective, so they may need a completely different form of organization through the same data in order to help them find what they're looking for. Another reason is that with complex data, it's often important to have more than one type of organization because each classification or each organization doesn't split the data into a small enough group to be understandable. The other thing that we need to be careful about is making assumptions about the way we organize things because the organization of something and the presentation of it are completely different choices. The organization is the mental model but the presentation is how we communicate that model, and these can be very different. I'll give you lots of examples here. Here's an example of driving directions. We're trying to get from California College of the Arts, which is partway between South of Market and Potrero Hill in San Francisco. We're trying to get to Golden Gate Park, which is on the other side of the city. This requires a sequence both in time and, and in the, uh, directions. And there's lots of ways to present what is essentially the exact same organization by time. Here we have a textual organization that gives us directions turn by turn through the city as we'll experience it. However, here's a visual way of expressing the exact same thing. And here is a map that does the same thing as well. So the organization of this information is exactly the same in all three of these cases, but the presentation of it is incredibly different. Some of these presentations will be helpful to some people, and they will hinder others. Here, in fact, is a fourth way of organizing the same kind of trip, this time from SFO to a hotel downtown, but the presentation is in voice. There's no visual component to the presentation at all. And this is more common, more and more, in technological systems with, let's say, conversational interfaces. Here's another example. A print book organizing the contents of the entire book. So the organization of it is from sequence, sort of start of the book to the end of the book. We have page numbers that help us organize these. Here the presentation is a typical table of contents topics laid out here in, in categories, combined with 
page numbers to help people get to where they're looking. Here's a completely different presentation of exactly the same organization. So here, different triplets of pages, of page spreads, in fact, because they relate to the same topics, are laid out as a map, which becomes the cover of the book, and are organized by location to other topics that are similar or related to them. In another example, here we have yellow pages, a typical yellow pages for those of you who may have never seen one. The organization of all of the information within the yellow pages is alphabetical, starting at A, ending at Z. And all of the categories that ads and, and listings might fall under are organized by alphabet. So the organization is alphabetical, and here the presentation is alphabetical as well. I worked for a company, for Richard Saul Werman, and a company called The Understanding Business that worked on a different kind of yellow pages because not everything is easily found in an alphabetical organization. Here's an example of all of the categories and subheads within the yellow pages that relate to automobiles or cars. And you can see that not everything starts with A. In fact, the analysis of the Pacific Bell Yellow Pages back in the 1990s that spurred the Smart Yellow Pages project found that very few of the categories, of the titles of these categories that people were looking for matched the word that they associated with it. So here is a categorical presentation of all of the information, in this case, that fits the automobile category. So it doesn't change the alphabetical organization of the yellow pages themselves, but it forms a categorical in index, basically, that helps speed people to the information that they're looking for. Without this kind of presentation, traversing the data set in a yellow pages becomes that much more difficult. Another example is an atlas. Most atlases are organized by alphabet, A to Z. In this case, an atlas of the United States starts with Alaska and ends with Wyoming, I believe. So the organization of an atlas is typically alphabetical, while the presentation of it is a map of some sort. Here we have on every page Wyoming, I believe. So the organization of an atlas is typically alphabetical, while the presentation of it is a map of some sort. Here we have on every page a different, isn't alphabetical, it's by location, and the presentation is still a map. But to traverse the data set is to traverse the United States itself. So the table of contents for the US Atlas, for instance, is the way to find the section of the country that you're driving through or that you're interested in. And the two page spreads throughout the, the Atlas are visualized right here on the cover as the table of contents with their page number so that you can quickly find things by location. This atlas is organized completely differently than most atlases. And Richard used to describe this difference as being driven by the fact that you didn't drive from the first state, Alaska, to the next state, maybe Arkansas. You didn't drive through the United States alphabetically. You drove through it locationally. So this made better sense as a driving atlas. Travel guides are a great example of different kinds of information design because they contain a great amount and diverse types of information about a city. Typically, guidebooks or travel guides are organized by categories, um, and they're presented as such in a typical table of con contents that moves from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. But not all travel guides are done this way. The access guides change this relationship to city data by organizing things by neighborhood. Again, Richard Saul Werman, who often takes a different approach to pretty much everything he encounters, felt that you don't really traverse a city first by uh, the hotel categories and look at all the hotels and then by all, go to all the restaurants and then go to all the museums, etc. He felt that you really learned about a city and experience a city by neighborhood. So why wouldn't the travel guide itself also be organized by neighborhoods. In this case, there is a textual table of contents of these neighborhoods, but they're done locationally. 
the table of contents relates directly to this city map. Additionally, most of the information, the, the primary use of the information in the book is spotted at the beginning of every neighborhood section with a map. This is because it's really a locational experience and he's trying to emphasize that you're having experience in a physical place and helping the travel guide mirror the experience that you're having uh, yourself personally. Wherever you are in a city, you can find that location on the map and see immediately what's around you regardless of what its category is because the distance between you and it is usually more important than the category itself. One of the nice things about the access guides is that if you read them before you go to a city, when you arrive in a city, you're almost always immediately oriented in that city and you have some idea of not just how the city's laid out, but what's around you at any given time. Another nice thing about it is because it's locationally oriented and presented, you often find things in the city that you would never run across simply because it's highlighted on the map and you hadn't gone through that neighborhood or through the book categorically. So you often find uh, interesting surprises, things you never would have looked up, simply because serendipitously you find yourself near them while you're traversing a city. There are other ways of organizing this information for city travel guides as well. One of them is by time. So we can organize all the information by the time of day, what happens in the morning, what happens midday, what happens in the evening, what happens late at night, etc. So here the organization is by time, but the presentation is by text. And here's an example of still the organization is by time, from start of the day to finish of the day. The presentation of it is a map. And these are the uh, Virgin travel guides, this one in particular for San Francisco. And they actually have two different maps. Things that you would do in the day, you find on the day map, and things that you might experience at night, you find on the night map. I found this a really original and interesting use of an organization of city data. There are other ingenious ways of combining the presentation of this information. So here we have the Dynamap for Manhattan. This is from 2003. And it's hard to tell here in this image, but the Dynamap is a lenticular map. So there's actually three different kinds of data presented on this flat panel that as you shift your perspective on the panel, you see those different kinds of data. So everything is still organized by location, but it's organized in three primary categories, whether it's city travel, transit locational information, whether it's uh, places of interest, uh, whether it's streets and boulevards, etc. So all of the information is overlaid on top of itself in three different sets of information. But as you, as you move the map around, you can have access to the, what is essentially a filter from that perspective. A last example here of travel guides is this sort of slightly interactive map that pops out in a folded um, travel guide. So it folds up really, really small, but you can instantly pull it open and it, it actually quite nicely expands so that you can see a larger version of the map. And when you're done, you just close it and it self folds into uh, its little book again. You may wonder why I'm using so many examples from print media. It's because there's so little exploration of alternatives in digital media today. Most services follow what's come before or what their competition is doing, what their designers or engineers or project managers or leaders saw someone else doing in their product. Partly, there's more pressure in, in print since the result is mostly a static artifact that still needs to serve several different needs. But there's no excuse for such little variation in digital media. Mostly, designers and engineers and producers and other business people are simply too lazy to think of alternatives, ones that may offer a much better mental model of the service and its contents. There are, however, some exemplary examples to point to in digital media. Think about a modern operating system on a smart device or tablet, etc. You can organize things by separating the applications and utilities and making them distinct, but you can present them in very different ways. You could 
list them alphabetically on the home screen so that people could find what they were looking for that way. You could build an image or a map of location um, of all those same apps and you get extra points if you make that customizable so people could put the icon for the application that they're uh, used to in a specific place. But that's not the only way to organize an operating system. Here's an example from the mid-90s of the Magic Cap desktop interface with most of the same applications that we saw in both the screen and the list before. This was a personal digital assistant device that was aiming to help you organize all the information in your life. What they used was a desktop metaphor, an image of an actual physical desk in, in sort of a physical office in order to organize these very same applications and utilities. Note that metaphors are often really limiting, though. Here, the metaphor breaks down pretty quickly because in order to get to another area or to get to services that aren't in the desk, on the drawers, etc., you have to leave the room, go into a hallway. You can see hallway uh, noted right there in the top right corner of the screenshot. Go down the hallway to another room, etc. It becomes very cumbersome very quickly. The Mac OS desktop, for example, works well because it drops the metaphor quickly before it gets cumbersome, something that here the Magic Cap desktop didn't. For example, most people don't put folders into other folders, into other folders, etc., but Mac OS still allows you to do this. They dropped the metaphor of a real desktop as soon as it became cumbersome because the real desktop didn't allow you to do certain things that obviously you would want to do in an operating system. For instance, being able to undo many actions. Here's a different metaphor for a CD-ROM from, again, the mid-90s. Here the metaphor can be used to orient people, to clue them into choices, as well as to set expectations of what they might encounter. And in this way it sets a scene uh, in more of a narrative space. In this example are different ways to organize and present financial information, in this case cryptocurrencies. The organization is along a spectrum from highest market cap to lowest market cap. And in this case, the example is coin cap, the presentation of market cap is in a textual list. However, here's another way of looking at all the same data. In fact, a little bit more than we could see in the same space before. Crypto Heat organizes everything by market cap, but gives a visual image or map of all of these cryptocurrencies. What's interesting about this presentation is that it packs a lot more information into a smaller, um, a smaller amount of space and we can see patterns and we can see activity that we would never have been able to see as easily in a list. However, it's not as expected or um, comfortable for some people. So there's no one way to present things that's going to work for everyone. There's no right or wrong here. There are just different kinds of alternatives if we choose to explore them. When we consider navigation through a mental model, we're also looking at its information design. There are different ways of helping people navigate a dense or complex set of information. Here, in a role-playing game, the navigation is presented in terms of location because the game is situated in a uh, locational experience, and more or less it mirrors what we experience in three dimensions. However, that's not the only way to navigate a game. Here is an example of a game that navigates via emotion. I've never seen this example um, played out or repeated by any other products. This is the Purple Moon pro products called, uh, in this case, Rocket's New School, but were built around narratives of this character, Rocket. And in order to navigate the game at different choice points, you had to choose her emotional reaction to whatever the scene was that that ended at this point. So we navigate by emotion throughout the narrative of the game and come to a narrative conclusion as a result. 
looking at more complex kinds of interaction, we have to change our understanding of the options of information design. So here, for a customer support system, in this case via telephone, all of the choices are organized by categories, but because voice is the interface, we have to present those in a sequence and usually number them so that people can key them in on uh, their keypad on their phone. However, that's not the only way to organize this information and present it. In a free-flowing conversation or conversational user interface, we don't have to stick to the same categories. And we don't have to present them in the same way. So instead of presenting each choice statically, one after the other, we can build a system that's much more complex that can simply ask people what, they, what their needs are and respond to the keywords that they respond with. Here's another interesting example of information design because the information that's presented in this online, in this case, historical encyclopedia, is presented with four different perspectives at all times about that information. The guides project layered information into historical articles by adding perspective and, and organizing them by characters that represented those perspectives. I've seen very few examples that repeat these kinds of complex organizations, sadly. Iconography is another kind of information design. The purpose of icons is to quickly communicate a concept without words or description. Done well, these can transcend language differences but may still not transcend cultural differences, so we have to be a little careful. And we've seen these systems for decades, of course, starting in international airports in the 60s. The main difference between icons and logos, by the way, is that icons signify generic things and logos signify specific things like a company or a person, etc. And these are often trademark or owned. Icons must also work together as a family, whereas logos don't necessarily need to. The first icons used in the Olympics, for instance, was in the Tokyo Summer Games in 1964. And while some icon systems strive for clarity, others strive for specific sort of styles or moods of illustration. Just like with most visual design, because icons may have different kinds of applications, they're usually required to work in monochrome as well as color. This isn't so much a constraint anymore with digital devices, except maybe the Kindle, but it still may be constrained by cost, for instance, in print. And it's always a good idea for icons to work in monochrome, color, and in a variety of detail and sizes, like emoji, because there's so much variation in screens on different devices. As well, our eyes work a certain way, regardless, and we see the monochrome image before we register the color. So it's always good for icons to work in black and white or monochrome, regardless of what the final color versions might be. I'll have another episode in the future on color theory that'll explain this in more depth. And the same is true in, in this case for logos as well. Icons have become incredibly common in digital media as a compact alternate way of communicating. This gives them a lot of utility. Large icon families can be made from common components, but icons may get too complex, which can make them too difficult to understand. Usually, icons can either be instantly understandable or easily learnable. This represents two kinds of uses by two different kinds of uh, users. Novices often need icons to be immediately understandable, while experts can learn to distinguish icons and learn their meaning, and they may provide more detail in their icons for experts, but rarely can the same icon be both immediately understandable as well as appropriately complex. When icons get too detailed, they become illegible, especially at small sizes. So simplification and stylization can improve readability and understanding. It also generalizes the depiction, which can increase its applicability to more cases and more contexts. From a very simple system, a wide range of icons can be created. 
The Foodicon system, a project I've been involved with, was primarily created by two designers at Adobe, Nayani D'Souza Hablitzel and Isabel Hamlin. Using this system, a huge variety of icons have been created for different parts and different concepts within our food system. In addition, these kinds of projects often create a visual language, not merely just a collection of icons. For example, here are visual elements that evolve to take on specific meanings or repeatable terms and concepts. Over time, adding recognized elements together combines specific meanings in understandable ways. For example, the first hand icon on the left has come to mean caring for or managing something or being friendly towards it in the system. Adding a bird to the hand communicates bird friendly. Adding two animals communicates humane treatment or humane management. Adding a flame communicates fire management. These meanings have evolved as the icons have been created by different designers all over the world receiving feedback from a common source. And this is how many icon systems grow larger and larger. They're actually a visual language, not just a collection of pictures. One of the things that a visual language can do is also point out the similarities or differences between terms. Because so many people around the world have developed processes in their own silos, it's not always apparent when they do the same thing as others, but from their own perspectives. For example, these three terms come from different traditions, but are essentially the same thing. The icon then becomes a signifier that people using these processes already have something in common, even when the terms would suggest otherwise. Because visual communication can be so critical, these kinds of collaborative design projects are proliferating in order to get open source resources into the hands of more and more people. Healthicons is another one of these initiatives. The Noun Project, in fact, is the world's largest repository of icons, now photos too, so it can be a valuable resource when you're creating a design response of your own. This is the end of the episode on information design. Hopefully, at the very least, it's whet your appetite to learn more about how to organize and present data in order to turn it into information in novel and appropriate ways. Thank you.